This is a ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Perkesee, Pennsylvania. I am Pastor McLaren. Uh, today we are making our way through R.C. Sproul's book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith, and we've made our way up to chapter 67. Now, I'm recording this video uh, prior to our meeting. We have been meeting on Thursday mornings at the A&N Diner in Sellersville, but we are attempting to make a change uh, and we'll be uh, meeting now on Saturday mornings. So uh, this is Thursday afternoon for me here on January the 16th. Um, so I am anticipating our conversation or discussion that will come about on Saturday. Um, so uh, if uh, I'll say this to the men, if I fail to consider some things that we talked about in our men's group or fail to mention that, um, please bear in mind that this is being recorded well before our meeting together. Now, we've been considering the nature of faith. We've talked about the, uh, the fact that faith has an intellectual component. Uh, it is not a mere blind faith. It is not... Uh, something that's grounded in credulity, but rather it is founded upon the rich revelation of God given to us in the world around us, in our own heart and nature, but most essentially and especially in God's special revelation given in Christ and Scripture. And so we... Uh, have a faith that is informed by God's Word, a faith that is informed by God's actions, His deeds in history and time. And as we interpret God's uh, nature uh, by His words and His works, we are led to trust Him and to commit ourselves uh, to His Word as being true, trustworthy, uh, worthy of obeying and following. So the nature of true faith is that it will um, seek to understand that which God has given to us in his word. It will understand truly, though not comprehensively, but truly it will understand what God has given to us about himself and about the way of salvation, about ourselves as well. It will understand that, accept it as true, and commit itself then to following after God's word. This is faith. Saving faith is distinguished from uh, a uh, profession of faith by virtue of the fact that it is faith focused on God's work in Jesus Christ. It's not a faith in one's self, a faith even in the general nature of God that uh, God will work good out of evil and the uh, Righteous will win in the end. Um, it's not a, a mere hope that everything will work out in the end, but rather faith is focused on God's work of redemption accomplished through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, took on our humanity, went in that perfect humanity to the cross, and paid the penalty for our sins. Uh, so faith is focused on Christ. Saving faith also uh, commits oneself entirely to Christ and rests on Him not only for the forgiveness of our sins, but also for the imputation of Christ's righteousness. And this is something that um, gets us into the area of our justification. How is it that a wicked person, a sinner like you and I, how is it that God can declare us to be righteous? God 
is just and he is unable to look upon sin with any favor, it would be uh, false for God to say that the wicked are just, just by saying it. Even if God says it, that doesn't make it so. Even God himself had to devise a plan, which he did in the councils of eternity, a plan for our redemption which would satisfy his own justice. And so that is done through the work of Christ uh, and by his death on the cross. So justification concerns how it is that we sinners are declared righteous before God. And it points us to the fact that in our justification, God not only removes our sin, and, and as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The, the, the penalty of sin has been removed. It's been taken away because Jesus bore that upon himself for us, such that through him we have the forgiveness of sins. Uh, that's one side of the equation. The other side of it is that God has provided us with a perfect and complete righteousness. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That righteousness has perfect and sinless life is communicated to us in faith and it is credited to our account as though it was ours. It is Christ's righteousness which we, we receive through faith and we rest on that righteousness and that righteousness alone so that we might be justified before God, so that we might be blessed in Christ. And so uh, we saw last time the nature of justification and faith. We are justified by faith. Faith is the means or the instrument through which God communicates to us this salvation, this righteousness of Christ. Faith receives that righteousness. Faith itself is not the righteousness. Faith is not a substitute for our failure to obey the law. It is not another kind of good work which God uh, credits with righteousness. Uh, in other words, recognizes it as an act of righteousness that uh, satisfies God. You know, the the uh, Arminian evangelical, to a certain extent evangelical point of view, is that uh, the exercise of faith on our part, that choice that we make of God, uh, that is the new work of the new covenant and God is now pleased if you will to lower his standards and it's no longer necessary for us to abide by the ten commandments under the law of Moses and to keep all the statutes and ordinances and all these kinds of things all of the uh, implications of God's law it, it, obviously we're not able to do that and so in this Arminian uh, perspective God provides us with a Another way to earn favor with God, and that is through the mere exercise of faith. Just believe, and you will be saved. That's the kind of thing that's being said uh, today among, among some who are in churches that are more Arminian, whether it's dispensational, fundamentalist, charismatic, uh, Baptist, uh, all these kinds of things. Faith becomes a substitute form of good works. And that's not the scriptural position. That's not the position of Reformed churches and the Reformed uh, confessions. Faith itself is not a good work. We're not saved by the exercise of faith in and of ourselves. The Reformed faith reminds us that faith itself is a gift of God. It's not something that we do in and of ourselves but rather it is the gift of God. And so God gives us the faith that in turn receives the righteousness of Christ so that the salvation is entirely of grace, entirely by the work of God on our behalf. And so we who are utterly at the mercy of God, who, whose only hope of salvation was in God's work of grace and mercy, have found that God indeed is gracious and merciful beyond all human imagining. Uh, 
And God has provided for us a wonderful Savior in Christ. And it is His righteousness that alone has value before God, that alone merits salvation, everlasting life. Uh, only His righteousness rises up to the level of perfection that God requires. And it's only that righteousness that can stand in our place such that we can be saved. If you do not rest in this provision of righteousness, you cannot be saved. If you rest in your own good works in any form or fashion and feel that either your faith or your good works, your sufferings, what have you, are sufficient before God and God will accept you on account of these things, then you are trusting in things which are tawdry, things which are cheap, things which are, are incapable of achieving what you think they can achieve. The problem with us, and this gets us into our discussion today on faith and works uh, in chapter 67 of Sproul's book. The problem today is, and it has been all throughout history, is that, if you will, the default position of the human heart and the human nature is that I must earn my way to life. Indeed, the Old Covenant, the Covenant of Works, uh, which God made with us in Adam. That covenant of works stipulated that we must obey God, keep His will. And uh, in that way, we would earn everlasting life. Um, Paul says in Romans chapter 2 that um, God will uh, bring life in immortality to light to those who obey the law, but to those who disobey wrath and condemnation. Well, who is really able to obey the law such that the, he, he would receive life and immortality from God? None of us. Nobody. Paul goes on in chapter 3 to say there is none good, no, not one, none who understands, none who seeks for God. That's fairly universal. That seems to include everyone who ever lived. We all fall short of the righteousness of God, or in more closely Paul's language, we fall short of the glory of God. We fail to achieve that glory by meriting it through our good works. Nonetheless, the default position within our hearts is that we need to work to earn salvation. The problem is we don't recognize that our works can never achieve that salvation. Our works can never merit God's blessing. Our works, even some very good works, fall far short of what God's perfect standard is. Now, I don't wish to demean or despise the many heroic, at times, the heroic sacrifices and efforts people make, not only for their families, but their loved ones, their friends, their country, even for strangers. Uh, there are situations where people do marvelous things, amazing things. But we tend to uh, inflate the value of these things in our own minds. Why? Because we interpret them from a humanistic perspective, from this horizontal perspective where we are comparing good works with our good works. We compare ourselves with ourselves, with the rest of humanity. And if our good works rise to a certain level, if they outweigh the bad for the most part, and we live a pretty clean, uh, outwardly moral life, then we can have some hope, some confidence that more than likely everything will work itself out at the end. God will accept us because God is love. Uh, this is what he does. And so uh, he will overlook our bad things, our faults, our weaknesses, and really in the mind of many the uh, source of our faults and weaknesses is not in us so much morally as in us metaphysically. That is to say, it's a part of how we are made. And so you see, in a, a backward sort of way, people blame God for any defects in their lives. 
They blame society around them. They blame their uh, heritage, their family relationships. Uh, they, they blame perhaps um, different genetic traits that they might have received, various personality traits uh, of which they're made. And they say, I can't help it. This is the way I am. Well, who made you like that? The hands point to God. And so if there is any fault in this humanistic worldview, it's really not so much with the individual as the God who made this individual finite, limited, uh, and fallible. And uh, it's to, to our credit that we're, we are able to rise above uh, the way that we are made and uh, do many good things. This is a, a humanistic view of our works righteousness. It's an inflated view which values them more than they truly are to be uh, understood in God's economy. Uh, God uh, looks for perfection. Jesus said to the disciples in his Sermon on Mount, you must be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, that's quite a challenge, obviously. And obviously, nobody is perfect. And so, by God's standard, our good works do not measure up uh, and do not merit God's blessing. Uh, they fail. They fall far short of that. And so, what we need to do is have an accurate view of our life in this world. Have a God-centered view we have to view things from the way God looks at them rather than the way we all look at them on this horizontal, uh, earthly level. And that requires nothing less than a work of God. Because within our hearts, we always want to think there's something worthwhile that I can achieve, something that I can do that's meaningful and significant, such that I can have God's favor, God's blessing, and hopefully have a better life in this world, if not in the next as well. This is a more humanistic point of view. God must change our hearts, enable us to stand on God's side, and say of ourselves that our good works not only fail to rise up to God's standard of perfection, but they are an offense to God. They are an offense to God, because they are not done for His glory and praise. They are not done according to His standard of righteousness. They are not done with the, the kinds of uh, motivations that God desires of us in love for our neighbor and love for God that might be a self-motivation involved or a motivation for financial gain or some other uh, idol that we want to please. There are many different motivations that are at work within the human heart. And so, uh, for us to be saved, we have to come to the point in our hearts and minds where we look at our lives and say, I agree with God's estimation of who I am and what I can accomplish. In other words, I agree that I am not good. I do not understand. I do not seek for God. Uh, all of my ways are corrupt. Lies fill my mouth. Violence is in, the, in my paths in the course of life. This is who I am. And that's a very humbling thing to say about yourself. What the gospel does is it strips us of our pride, removes any sense of self-worth, self-righteousness, uh, merit before God, and says, I must utterly depend upon God for his mercy and grace. I must utterly depend upon the righteousness of Christ to save me because Apart from that, I have absolutely no hope at all. Have you confessed that about yourself? Do you appreciate the righteousness of Christ to this effect? Do you value the fact that Christ died for you and his righteous life is yours through faith? Well, as we get more into uh, this chapter on faith and works, Dr. Sproul raises the uh, concern about the relationship of these two. And 
it, it comes not only from the perspective of the, the uh, Arminian evangelical and really uh, the mainline Protestant as well who says that there's something that I can achieve that in some way or measure merits God's favor. Uh, and then there's the, the Roman Catholic point of view, uh, which similarly uh, looks to us to be able to provide some sort of work that merits salvation. Now, let me talk to you for a moment about the Roman Catholic point of view. Uh, you can, by the way, uh, consult that view in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And if you want, uh, you can go to sections numbers uh, 1989 through 1997 or so, and in my edition of this book, uh, I don't know what year this is, Let's see if I can find it here, uh, which looks like 1995, in my edition it's on page, uh, well, 535 is where it begins. And in this statement, now mind you, this uh, Catechism of, of the Catholic Church occurs in the, the, the flow of Roman Catholic history and in particular uh, in, in view its juxtaposition with its rival, the Protestant faith. And uh, the uh, development of Romanism's thinking about justification is in some measure uh, responsive to Martin Luther and John Calvin and their descriptions of justification by grace through faith alone, not as the result of works. And so there was the Council of Trent at the time of Calvin in which the uh, Roman Church uh, made certain assertions about the nature of justification from their point of view. And those assertions made way back then are essentially unchanged over the course of time. Uh, there is, there has been a, a conversation between Roman Catholics and Lutherans back at the end of the uh, 20th century where they, they began to try to negotiate a, a statement on justification, which is the key uh, barrier to fellowship, if you will, between Romanism and Lutheranism. And uh, there are debates as to how successful that statement was um, Dr. Lethem points to the uh, evaluations by Michael Horton and another fellow by the name of Lane. And, and uh, both Horton and Lethem with him side on the, the uh, point of view that Romanism really did not change in the statements they made about uh, evangelicals and Catholics together, I think was one title of one of the works at least. Um, but in any case, really Lutheranism began to move towards Rome rather than Rome towards Lutheranism. And uh, if you understand the developments of uh, modern modernism, liberalism within the mainline Protestant churches, Lutheranism included, um, you find that there is uh, an openness, a tolerance, a, a, a kind of uh, an embrace of all different points of view, a relativistic point of view within the mainline Protestant churches that accepts most any expression of faith as long as it is sincere. Um, and that seems to be holding much more of the, the, the day within the Lutheran church as well. But anyway, in, in the Catholic church, as they talk about justification, they talk not so much about the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us through faith, but rather it is the impartation or the infusing of Christ's righteousness into our lives. And justification becomes not an act of God's free grace whereby he declares us righteous in his sight, but justification takes on the nature of sanctification and it is a continuous work of God's grace in our lives, whereby we are more and more conformed and more and more earn and merit God's blessing in life. And so let me read to you uh, from uh, the Catholic Catechism. Here is, um, well, look at 
section 1989. I'll read the entire section for you and emphasize the last statement, which is a quote from the Council of Trent. It says, The first work of the grace of the Holy Spirit is conversion, effecting justification in accordance with Jesus' proclamation at the beginning of the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did you catch that language there? Conversion effects justification. Now, from a reform point of view, at that moment that we are converted, we are justified before God. Uh, we are converted, uh, and we come, which is uh, our expression of repentance and faith in Christ. And at that moment, we are justified before God. But to use the language of effect, I think, is misleading, and it gets us into the, the point of view of, of Romanism that justification is more of a process than a declaration. It is something that begins in us and works its way through the course of life rather than the simple once-for-all imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believer through faith. So they quote from Jesus, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They go on, Moved by grace, man turns toward God and away from sin, thus accepting forgiveness and righteousness from on high. Sounds pretty good. They then quote from the Council of Trent in these words, Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the interior man. Now, it can't get much more explicit than that. Justification merges into sanctification, actually becomes sanctification. As one of uh, the commentators uh, on uh, the Roman faith has observed, um, the Roman church really does not have a doctrine of justification. It has a doctrine of sanctification. In other words, there, there's no uh, imputation of the righteousness of Christ through faith, with faith as the gift of God and as merely the instrument through which that righteousness is received. No, uh, in, in the Roman church, Essentially, justification is sanctification, even as we just read from the Council of Trent. Um, now, the next section, 1990, says, Justification detaches man from sin, which contradicts the love of God, and purifies his heart of sin. Justification follows upon God's merciful initiative of offering forgiveness. It reconciles man with God. It frees from the enslavement to sin, and it heals. Uh, the point I wanted to bring up there is that uh, you have the development of love here, and the emphasis that you're going to find uh, in the Roman view uh, of love. And that comes into view in section, the next section, 1991, where it says, Justification is at the same time the acceptance of God's righteousness through faith, they stop there, that would be good. God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. That sounds excellent, right? Righteousness, they go on to say, or justice, here means the rectitude of divine love. With justification, faith, hope, and charity are, are poured into our hearts, and obedience to the divine will is granted us. And so here you see justification is not merely the reception of the righteousness of Christ through faith, but it's faith connected with hope and love. And love is that portion of our sanctification through which we perform the good works that God uh, is pleased, and, pleased to bless and uh, merit with everlasting life. Uh, the next section. Uh, the justification has been merited for us by the passion of Christ who offered himself on the cross as a living victim, holy and pleasing to God, whose blood has become the instrument of atonement for the sins of all men. All well and good. Justification is conferred in baptism, the sacrament of faith. It conforms us to the righteousness of God, 
who makes us inwardly just by the power of his mercy. Its purpose is the glory of God and of Christ and the gift of eternal life. And it continues there. Um, you see here, justification is conferred how? Through faith? Through the church sacrament of baptism. You're justified by baptism in the Roman church. That, that's what they say here. It's conferred in baptism the sacrament of faith. It conforms us to the righteousness of God. Here's conformity, which is that personal renewal. It makes us inwardly just by the power of his mercy. So you see, um, in the Roman church, the righteousness of Christ is not just imputed to us, but it is infused within us. And we work by the grace of Christ to live for God. And is that righteousness in us, which is exercised in faith in the course of life, that is what merits salvation. So we are saved by the righteousness of Christ, but also by our exercise of faith, love, and hope in the course of life. And this is where the, the Reformed faith differs from Romanism. Our good works do not come into view in, in terms of our justification. Our justification is solely limited to the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. Receiving that, God forensically, legally declares us to be righteous in His sight. Not for the value of any good works that we perform, but wholly and entirely by the good works that Christ has performed for us. By that we are justified. Now, the Roman church comes back to the reformers and says, well, you see, you are uh, antinomian because you are saved by faith alone and not by faith which works. Faith and works are what save us in the Roman view, not faith alone or faith or not only by faith, as one writer described it, not only by faith, but by faith and our good works. In the Roman view, our good works come into view for our justification. Now, they say that you take away all motivation for good works in a Reformed point of view uh, if you remove from them the value or the hope of being uh, meritorious and of earning everlasting life. In the Roman view, if you don't have this motivation of earning eternal life, then you will not be doing good works. You will live as you please. After all, you're justified. You're justified by faith alone, so nothing more to do. Now, that's an objection that was raised against Paul himself, which he uh, considers in uh, the beginning of Romans. In the uh, Let me see if I can remember this correctly. In Romans... Um, the third chapter, he talks about this kind of thing where uh, people slanderously uh, report of Paul and the early Christians that uh, we can sin so that grace may abound. You know, it, it's this licentiousness, this wickedness. You know, once we're saved, now we can live as we please. Um, one of my friends uh, recently commented on an experience he had growing up within a Lutheran church where uh, I, I believe it was a youth pastor or somebody like that encouraged some of the college students to wear a shirt which says go and sin boldly or just sin boldly. It was a phrase from Martin Luther who uh, made that comment in view of the fact that we are justified by faith in Christ alone and not by our good works. Now in the context Luther was not encouraging an immoral life by any means. Rather, what he was saying is that our sins, when we fall into them, do not threaten our justification before God. Christ paid the full penalty for our sins, and his righteousness stands in our place. And so, using the hyperbole, Luther would say, go and sin boldly. He's not encouraging people to sin. He's encouraging people to rest in Christ and what Christ has done for us. And not to be concerned about the fact that I might be losing my salvation by the sin that I committed this morning in, in lying or in getting angry or what have you. 
No, uh, do not be concerned about that. Confess your sin, seek God's forgiveness, but know that uh, in Christ we have a full and complete salvation already in Him. Uh, but uh, when you properly understand justification, then that uh, appears to uh, expose you to the charge that then you can live as you please, and that's certainly not the case. Um, as you go through Romans chapter 3, you come to uh, Paul talking about the relationship between faith and the law, uh, faith and the principle of works, observing the law. He says, where then is boasting? Verse 27 of Romans 3. It is excluded on what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. In other words, uh, there's no place for boasting. Boasting is all a part of good works which merit eternal life in the old view, and then you would have something to boast about. Paul's whole point is we have nothing to boast about because we have no good works. And so uh, faith removes any sense of boasting in anything that we do, and uh, we are justified by faith apart from the observances of the law. So we're saved by grace, and there's no place for boasting about what we do. I don't boast about my exercise of faith. I don't boast about my obedience to law, my acts of love, my charity, my uh, attending to the poor and the needy and these kinds of things. None of that does me any good. But listen to what Paul goes on to say. For we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Uh, that's a specific argument against Judaism in his day, but it applies as well to Romanism today, which insert, inserts uh, observing the law as part of our justification. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. So we're saved, all of us, the, the Jew, the, the religious uh, ritualistic Jew, the, the, the Gentile who does not have the law, we're all saved only on the same basis, faith in Christ and in Christ's work alone. None of our ritualism, none of our uh, natural good works, none of that can save us. And then Paul says this, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Okay, now we come to the question of the relationship between obedience to law and faith which justifies and saves. And Paul says, no, not at all. We don't nullify the law by our faith. Rather, he says, we uphold the law. It is only the Reformed position that properly upholds the law of God. The law of God says that the sinner must die. The Reformed position recognizes that we must die, and we do die, either in person ourselves or in Christ our substitute. And so the law is satisfied in Christ. And what is more, the law's demands for a positive righteousness are perfectly fulfilled in Christ. And so this side of the law as well, not only its penalties for wickedness and rebellion, but also its rewards for righteousness, salvation, eternal life, those rewards for righteousness come to us because of Christ. And so the demands of the law are met in Christ, both negatively and positively. And thereby we are enabled then uh, to be saved. And so it is the Reformed faith that establishes the law. Now, we'll go on to note that the true saving faith is a faith that actually responds to God then and lives a life of good works. Faith, true saving faith, is never alone. That is to say, saving faith rests in Christ for our justification. Having been justified, having been saved, we now work out the effect of that in our lives by a life of good works, faith in God, obedience, love, and so forth. And this is where we come to what James has to say in his second chapter of his, his epistle. Uh, is a man justified by faith alone, without works? And James' response is, no, we're saved by our works. Now, isn't that a, an explicit contradiction of what Paul says? Well, not at all. If you understand James in his context, he's dealing with the nature of faith. 
And there are some who make a profession of faith, but really do not have true saving faith, because a true saving faith that actually does rest in Christ alone for deliverance from sin and for a new life, that saving faith will show itself by a new life. A mere empty profession of faith without a changed life shows that you've not truly been justified before God yet. And so um, we look to our works for evidence of the fact that we have a genuine saving faith. A faith that it, uh, receives justification through the righteousness of Christ. And so James's point of view is from the human perspective as we look at individuals who make a claim or profession of faith, do we know whether they are justified or not? Well, we can see evidence of that in either a life of obedience or a life of disobedience. And the disobedient life is evidence for the fact that there is a problem with that faith. It is merely verbal. It is merely a profession. It's not sincere. It's not devout. It's not from the heart. It's only meant to flatter and please others, but it really does not express the inner uh, heart of the individual. True saving faith rises up from within the heart, it reflects the renewed nature of the believer, and it works itself out in a life of faith, obedience, love for God, a desire to do His will. And so this is the nature of a true saving faith. Uh, faith, we are justified by faith without works in the sense that only the righteousness of Christ is meritorious for justification. Our works are not meritorious for salvation. No, our works are evidence of the fact that we have uh, truly uh, embraced Christ with a living faith. We are united to Him. We've received His righteousness and we rest in that righteousness alone for our salvation. Well, there could be a lot more said on this topic and we could go into much more detail and I've gone uh, uh, to quite an extent so far. Uh, but I hope that that is helpful for you. And uh, we'll uh, continue on in our study next time. Um, thank you for listening and watching if you're still with me at this point. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, may God richly bless you through His uh, glorious and faithful Word. God bless. Take care. Bye.